Holy smokers, this ain't no dang jokers, folks. The four horsemen of the public count are absolutely running again here today. Meta, we're up another $5,800 here today on Meta. Tesla, another $8,500. Amazon today, $5,300. And Elf on a Shelf, $1,300. Those stocks continue to roll the four biggest positions in the public count. But I see something brewing, folks, okay? And I want to give everybody a little warning out there. So everybody's prepared for what's going to happen. I'm positioning a little bit in the market for certain situations that I see transpiring here. I want to run you through this, the risk of this. And um, this is not something people are even really discussing right now. And I'm kind of looking out there. I'm like, uh, we got something out there that might just be something we need to take a look at here, okay? And so I want to run you through it. Um, I'm going to show you what I was out there doing in the market here today, which I actually made some moves in the market here today. Um, and, and we'll go through it all. So appreciate you joining me. Thanks for being subscribed, folks. And I uh, hope you get a lot of value out of today's video because it's a very, very important video, okay? So first thing I want to start out here is looking at the latest AAII investor sentiment numbers, okay? Uh, numbers are, once again, very bullish again, okay? We have uh, obviously flipped this market from the market being overwhelmingly pessimistic and bearish on the market, which is, you know, where we certainly were six months ago, and now we've gotten to the point where the market's very, very, very bullish, and so bullish that now at this point in time, folks, um, we're well above historical averages for how bullish the market actually is right now, right? You look at the last three weeks, 44.5%, 45.2%, and nearly 43% of investors are bullish on the next six months in the market. The historical average is 37.5%, right? But not only that, and this matters just as significantly, just as significantly, is the market is moving far less bearish now. Look at the last three weeks. Only 24% of investors bearish on the market in the next six months. 22% in the latest week, 27.8% of investors are bearish on the market in the next six months, which means the bears are giving up now at this point in time. They're calling it quits. They're throwing in the towel, right? The historical average is 31% of investors are basically bearish on the market in the next six months. So that's what we have going on at this market. Now, the reason this matters so significantly is when you think about going into this year, right, you know, the Wall Streeters were basically in consensus saying don't buy the stock market in the fourth quarter of 2022, which is why the market just went down and down and down, right? They're also saying don't buy it in Q1. It's going to be a bad first half of 2023. That's what they were saying time and time again. And, you know, this is one of the reasons I love having the reaction channel, right? Because I react to a ton of these Wall Streeters all the time, giving their opinions and perspectives. And there was overwhelming consensus. Don't buy, don't buy. And things are going to get a lot worse for stocks. You're going to get a lot better deals. You know, they were saying, don't buy Meta under 100. Don't buy Tesla at 100. Don't buy NVIDIA at 100. Because you know what? You're going to get it far cheaper than that. There was... 100% wrong. And, and one of the most wrong things, you know, you could see Wall Streeters in consensus, um, you know, one of the biggest mistakes they've made in a long time, right? But they were all saying buy stocks in the second half of 2023, right? Bad first half of the year, strong second half of this year. This was a consensus out there. And we've had completely the opposite, where the first half stocks are doing tremendous, a lot of money being made. And I hope you guys have made a lot of money this first half of the year, right? Which the first half of the year is about to close. We got about one week left in, in the first half of this year, right? And now we got a real interesting situation where we're going to go into the second half of the year when everybody was saying the stock market was going to be strong. But the, the only difference is we just came off an incredibly strong first half this year. So now you start to run in this pickle where it's like, are we really going to have a second, a strong second half of the year, right? And this kind of makes me think, and you have to at least consider this, could we have a bad July through the fourth quarter of the year? Could we actually have a bad back half of the year where worries get amped up in a significant way, where you have some major profit taking off of this, you know, kind of bull run we've had here, and you have maybe, maybe a major sell-off in the market, right? And it's something you, you have to consider because you kind of always have to think in the kind of opposite of the market's thinking. And now all of a sudden the market's moving all bullish and getting way less bearish. And you kind of have to think like maybe there's some risk on that bearish side in that bearish perspective, right? Now, two things before we get into the major risks that I have to show you, okay? And I'm even going to pull you up Goldman Sachs annual report. And we're going to find a few hidden gems in there that I want to show you guys from, from you know, recently here, okay? But two things you need to do, okay? Two things you need to do, even in a market like this. The first one is, you've got to 
continue to take advantage of long opportunities you see in the market. So if you love Palantir at $14 this year and you think Palantir is going to be $50 in a few years from now, you've got to take advantage of that, okay? Regardless of what the market feels. If you think Revolve's a great deal or Foot Locker or Cheesecake or PayPal or whatever stocks you believe are undervalued and you love for the next you know, three to five years, you've got to continue to take advantage of those deals, regardless of whatever Wall Street's up to, whatever Wall Street consensus is, whatever they're thinking, okay? And that's first and foremost, always focus on you and what you believe are the great companies to be in over the next many years and what you think are undervalued opportunities out there, okay? The second thing is, and this is something not a lot of people are taking serious right now, but you absolutely need to, in my personal opinion, is hedge your portfolio a little over the next 30 to 60 days. Just a little bit. You don't have to be a massive short seller. You don't have to, you know, be all bearish on the market and think, you know, everything's going to crash. Hedging is just a little insurance, okay? It's just a little insurance. In case things go bad, your portfolio is hedged a little bit. And I can tell you, most of you guys watching this video right now are plenty competent to hedge your portfolios up a little bit, okay? You're plenty competent. You know, I know a lot of you guys, and I get to see how many people join the private stock group. A lot of you guys are highly intelligent. You work very sophisticated jobs, you make good money, and you enjoy this sort of content that's 20, 30 minutes of video, right? This isn't like some TikTok thing that attracts, I don't know, 16-year-olds or whatever, right? You guys are plenty competent to hedge your portfolios a little bit, okay? This is something you should absolutely consider doing over the next 30, 60 days. With the markets running the way they're running, the Europeans' market running the way they're running, and a lot of you guys have no, no insurance just in case things go let's call it bad, in the back half of this year or into 2024. Hedge up a little bit, okay? And I'll show you some of the hedges I did here today because I actually did some active hedges out there, okay? Now, the reason this is, I think, so vitally important right now, other than just people don't have any hedges on right now, is a few reasons, okay? The first reason being, you know, you look at the trueflation numbers. Trueflation has us in the United States right now at about 2.4%. Uh, in, in terms of the trueflation, in terms of, you know, the real CPI right now, right? Uh, UK, they have them at 13% right now. 13 flipping flapjacking percent. Now, US government numbers, uh, as far as, you know, and obviously the US government numbers lag, but the US government numbers had us at 4% recently, right? Um, which really was showing, that was showing May numbers, right? Um, and then UK government had us at, or UK government has their numbers at 8.7%, so almost 9%. So the bottom line is inflation is still completely out of control in the UK. The, the inflation is still completely out of control in Europe in general. They're still way behind the fight compared to the United States. We actually have it really flipping flapjacking good compared to what's going on in Europe right now. Okay. Now there's significant risk in Europe and why this matters so significantly. It matters in a massive, massive way for several different reasons. One reason is the European Central Bank is likely going to have to continue to raise rates for quite some time, whereas the Fed is likely done, in my opinion, now at this point in time. The next move the Fed will likely make will be probably in 2024 at some point. It's now looking like there's a possibility that if, if the U.S. economy got rough at all in the back half of the year, there's a potential the Fed could cut. But I think the Fed's likely done raising rates. It just doesn't make sense for them to keep raising rates at this point in time. The ECB is in a totally different situation. They got to keep raising rates and they're going to have to keep raising rates for at least likely the rest of this year. And we'll see what happens in 2024. Now, that matters in a, in a massive, massive way. And here's why, okay? If you don't know the way a lot of these mortgages, I guess we can call them, are structured in basically Europe, they're doing a lot of what we were doing in the United States, but actually to a much bigger extent back prior to the housing crisis, okay? From Sweden to Spain, via the United Kingdom and Greece, people that borrow mostly in, at variable rates to buy their homes are being hit hard by the meteor, meteor, meteoric rise in interest rates. And so with the ECB continuing to raise rates, a lot of people are on variable loans for their home, which means likely they're going to have to pay a extremely higher price to basically stay in their home if they want the rest of this year and into 2024. It's a bad scenario, especially when you're already dealing with out of control inflation still in Europe in general. So this is going to create a dynamic where they could, keywords could, have a serious housing crisis in Europe. And to an extent that could be as big as what we saw in the United States or even bigger. When you just look at the numbers and the data around this, it is, it's pretty frightening. And for us in America, we don't think a lot 
about Europe in general. Hold your flipping flapjack and horsies. Now to show you some reference on how rough this really got, and, and I understand you know different people are at different age brackets and, and kind of understanding of the markets and things like that, okay? This matters significantly. This was the United States and the foreclosure epidemic we had in the United States. And there was several different reasons for that. One was variable interest, uh, these variable interest rate loans, where things all of a sudden ballooned, and next thing you know, people just literally couldn't afford their mortgage. And so what happened is foreclosures happened, short sales happened, a bunch of that stuff, right? Um, and it actually hit the worst. A lot of people think the worst year was actually 2009. 2010 was actually the worst year. 2.9 million foreclosure filings. That's insane, okay? 2009 was awful. 2008 was awful. And um, it took us years to, to obviously dig out of that, right? And the housing market was a disaster for years to go in the future. And so if you're thinking about this European situation, you know, I don't know if I want to say it's going to be as bad um, as it was in the United States, but when you, when you kind of think about this a little bit down the road here, and down the road meaning 6, 12, 18 months from now, it is very scary, especially if unemployment starts to go up. If that starts to go up in a significant way in Europe, then you compound things because that's what happened in the United States where you had a situation where unemployment was going up. Uh, obviously, people's uh, variable rates also jumped up. And next thing you know, you ended up in this absolute crazy housing crisis where people just walking away from homes left and right, either because they were forced to or because it made just financial sense. Markets like this one uh, I'm in right now, Phoenix, Arizona, you know, we're talking about prices dropped over 50%. 50% folks, okay? Like numbers that no one could even conceive of in the past, right? That's how bad it got. So I wouldn't say necessarily Europe's gonna have it that bad, but dang, man, I gotta say, this is a scary, scary situation. And it happens fast and it kind of happens out of nowhere when people aren't really looking at it, okay? Now to take you a little more in depth here on why it matters so much for the market, if Europe was to get in a very bad spot where that economy really got devastated and entered a major deep recession in Europe, let's say for instance, which is a potential, especially with inflation dragging on, they're going to have to continue to, to raise rates. It, this is an extremely important market for some of the biggest U.S. companies, right? In terms of Apple, I mean, the, Europe's their, biggest, their second biggest market. So, I mean, to put in reference, if you, you have to combine China and Japan together to basically put it where it's bigger than Europe. That's insane to think about, right? That's how big the European market is. So if Europe, if Europe enters a major recession, folks, that's going to be very detrimental to a lot of these massive public companies. One of them obviously being Apple in that sort of scenario, right? Tesla, my Tesla, a stock that's very important to me. I mean, if we look at Tesla's numbers, right? U.S. and China, massive markets, but other categories, mostly Europe. Let's just call it what it is. It's a huge market for, for Tesla, right? And so if there was a very deep, big recession in Europe, I can tell you it's going to negatively affect Tesla's numbers for a bit. A bit meaning anywhere from probably one to three years if there was a big deep recession there, okay? And so this is where some of the worries start to, to come in, okay? If you look at Goldman Sachs, which Goldman Sachs is, I believe it's the second biggest weighting of the Dow Jones Industrial Average, okay? Goldman Sachs. If we pull up Goldman Sachs 2022 annual report here, we're going to find some interesting things. On page 99 of 264, under loans and uh, debt securities, what we're going to find is 35% of the total, right, is basically e EMEA, okay? And, and just, you know, think of the lion's share of that is Europe, Europe specifically. Real estate represents 20%, 20%, folks, 20%. If the, if the real estate market gets hit hard in Europe, I can tell you that's going to negatively impact Goldman Sachs numbers in, in, in an absolute epic way. And this is where you get into the loan contagion problems, what boils over, because, you know, one of these banks getting hit hard, next thing you know, it affects another bank and another bank, and especially when you're talking about big dogs like Goldman Sachs, right? If we go to page 130 of 264 under management discussion and analysis for Goldman Sachs here, we're going to find something very interesting. This, now we're looking at credit exposure, okay? And credit exposure in EMEA, right, which think of mostly, once again, Europe, is about 43% of their credit exposure is EMEA. That's substantial, folks. If Europe was to go into some major deep recession, I can tell you this is going to hurt a company like Goldman Sachs in a pretty scary way. And the, the thing is, when it comes to this and, and when it comes to these banks and investment banks, you don't actually know where the bottom is. And that's something we learned in the great financial crisis. That's even something we saw, obviously, in 2022, or excuse me, earlier this year with a lot of those regional banks going under. 
you don't know where the bottom is because the way they do these loans and you don't see a lot man you don't see a lot then they have off balance sheet type stuff and i'm just telling you man although these these industries are very regulated sometimes they get around the regulations and it gets messy and next thing you know this is like how did how did all of a sudden svb and some of those others all of a sudden go at it they, i mean they, it was like one month they were perfectly fine the next month everybody's like wait a minute could these go under next minute they're under i mean it happens quick right and so that's a scary thing man and, and it, it, all you start to have to have is a little weakness come in there and next thing you know you got a mess right in terms of their net revenues last year for Goldman Sachs, 27% came from EMEA. Once again, think about Europe mostly, right? So this is why it matters in a significant, significant way to a lot of American companies. And so if you're thinking about the American markets, right, the U.S. markets, we have risk. And it's not just from like the U.S. side of like, well, what if the U.S. had a recession? It's really from this European side and what could be potentially brewing in the mortgage market in the real estate market in europe and what that could mean and the ramifications of what that could mean for the european economy for the next several years and what that can mean for obviously american corporations when you're talking about significant amounts of credit exposure coming from europe significant amounts of revenue profits coming from europe and many other various things folks so this is something that i'm looking at and i you know I don't think it's a risk that's really talked about enough. A lot of people have been talking about the potential for if inflation comes back in the U.S. and the Fed had to raise rates more. That's something that's talked about a lot. Another situation that's talked about is a U.S. recession. It's talked about a lot, right? But what is not talked about a lot, and as somebody that watches a lot of Flip and Flapjack and CNBC and watches these Wall Streeters go on there all the time, they're not talking nearly about enough about the risks of the European market. And what could potentially happen the european central bank having to raise rates considerably more and what that would mean for these variable rate loans and what that would mean for the overall european economy and could we see a very deep nasty recession in europe it's a potential folks it's definitely a, a, and it's a serious potential it's not just like a pie in the sky like oh you know let's just talk about scary stuff to talk about scary stuff this is actual like legit potential scary thing out there okay and so at the end of the day, this, this is a time period that it makes sense to hedge a little bit. And let me show you some of the hedges I went ahead and did here today, okay? So one hedge I did here today is Apple, right? Um, hedged up on Apple a little bit. So I bought about $4,000 worth of puts on Apple, $180 strike price. These expire March 15th of 2024, just in case, just in case. I think about all my hedges as insurance, just in case this market goes bad. Hey, you know, I'm going to be able to obviously make a bunch of money on the backside if we were to have a major 10, 20, 30 percent type drop in the indexes. Never mind if we had something more significant than that, then I'm really going to make out on some of these these insurance policies, I call them. Right. I bought some Estow here today. Twenty three dollars strikes on those. Uh, these expire January of 2024. So just in case we had some crazy weakness in the back half this year, um, I'm covered as far as that goes. I did do a few little long calls but it's so small money you know these are pretty big hedges for me by the way you know when if i'm going long a stock for me to buy twenty eight hundred dollars of a stock or buy four thousand dollars of a stock that's not much for going long but for hedges it's significant and the reason it's so significant is you know at the end of the day if you're doing things like like puts and calls and things things like that right you're talking about you're way amping up the the kind of movement there and the other significant way is whatever I have long in the market is going to be a much bigger number than what I'm hedged. So I'm going to have a, a certain percent hedged overall in my portfolios, but it's going to be a very small number relative. But a $4,000, and you know, this is roughly $7,000 worth of hedges I did here today, right? So that's a, that's a, you know, a pretty significant number. And so I'm looking at continuing to stay hedged in this market. I don't want to get, certainly, I don't want to get too bullish. Obviously, I'm mostly long, right? We know I got huge positions in, in a lot of very important stocks, right? And I'm going to continue to buy long positions that I see are attractive opportunities week after week after week. But I can tell you, I'm not, I'm not going to stop hedging this market. I can tell you that. Know what the sort of risk we have out there in some of these places, I'm going to continue to hedge. And at the end of the day, like, like I said, this is like insurance. So I think of it as, you know, most of the time you're not going to use your health insurance and you're just throwing money away. Most of the time you're not going to use your homeowner's insurance or renter's insurance. So you're just throwing money away, right? Most of the time you're not going to use your car insurance. So you're just throwing money away, right? But then the day when you do need it, it comes in handy in a major, major way. That's the way I think about hedging in this market, especially with some of the risk out there. The way I think about this game is like, 
you know, I'd much rather stay a little hedged. It's going to give me a big level of comfort. It allows me to continue to add to my long positions I love for the next, you know, three, five, seven years and, and do that game while being able to be hedged just in case, just in case this thing gets ugly. And, um, you know, there I am in a, in a pretty sweet spot in, in, in regards to, you know, being able to capitalize on that if there was some major downside in the back half this year or into early uh, 2024. And I'm going to put on some more hedges. Uh, you'll see me likely put on more hedges around, it depends, but probably I would say between September and November, you'll likely see some, me put on some more hedges. And those will really be for 2024 overall. The only way I might not is if we saw a massive downdraft in the market over the next six months. If we saw a massive downdraft, then I probably wouldn't hedge going into 2024 because I would probably assume that most everything's baked in at that point in time. But assuming we don't already have a massive crash in the back half this year, I'll be hedging going into 2024. It's my insurance, man. And as somebody that's got a lot of money invested long in this market, I need insurance because I can tell you if things go bad, you know, obviously the portfolios aren't going to be looking the way they've been looking, right? And so I'd rather just have that insurance. Hopefully it all expires worthless. And uh, because if that happens, I'm going to be looking good. You know, we, we know that, right? No different than obviously what's played out so far this year, okay? So consider some hedging out there. It's worth it, guys. It's worth it. Explore it a little bit. Just a few percent of the portfolio. And if, if the stuff hits the fan, as they say, it'd be happy. It'd be a very happy camper that you at least hedged a little bit. And if not, hey, it's like health insurance. Like how you, Then you'll be happy you didn't have to use it because likely that means all your stocks are probably beasting, okay? So that's something I'm considering. As far as further hedges in that, I mean, I don't know. I might consider hedging Tesla a little bit. Um, if that stock continues to run over the next 30 to 60 days, I might consider hedging a little bit on Tesla. Um, I don't want to sell any shares because every share I've ever sold to Tesla, I regret but I wouldn't mind buying some puts. That's what I should have done. But the dumb thing was I sold most of my Tesla shares, right? I have what, $400,000 or so left in Tesla stock here. Um, let's go back up here. What do I have left of Tesla? So I have $440,000 of Tesla stock. That's all my Tesla stock, by the way. Uh, actually, I think I own like one or two shares in the Patreon portfolio. So it's such a small amount, right? So I own basically about $440,000 of Tesla stock. What I should have done with Tesla, it's been so much smarter. Instead of selling Tesla shares like I did, um, I sold a lot of those shares, what was that, 2021, maybe even early 2022. What I should have done, what I should have flipped and flapjack and done, is I was pretty worried about Tesla, what I thought was an overvaluation of Tesla stock, right? And I was pretty worried about, you know, that stock coming down significantly. So I decided to cash shares, right? What I should have done instead of that, I should have bought damn puts out of the money. Do you know how much money I would have made if instead of selling Tesla shares, I would have said, you know what, let me just hedge my position a little bit because I could have had, you know, I don't know how much. If I would have held all my Tesla shares, I might have had two or three million dollars at that point in time if I would have had held all my Tesla shares. So I could have said, let me just hedge up a little bit here. Let me buy some way out of the money puts just in case this thing goes bad like I'm scared about. And I could have bought $30,000 worth of puts. I can tell you, last year, those put options would have increased to easily a half million dollars to a million dollars. Then what I could have done is I could have taken that half million to a million dollar profit on about a $30,000 hedge. And I could have then when bought Tesla at low hundreds, uh, you know, at the end of last year and going into this year. I mean, my gosh, would that have been the ideal situation? So that, looking back in hindsight, that's what I should have done. And so that's why, you know, sometimes a little hedging here, a little hedging there can't hurt. That's all I'll say about that. It's insurance. It's insurance, man. I appreciate everybody joining me as always. Thanks so much, folks. Hope you got some good value out of today's video. And uh, hope I, you know, educated folks on kind of what's going on out there. Two things in the description area. One is if you want to apply for my private group, that is in the description area down there. Second thing is if you want access to the $10 Patreon tier, we're going to bring that out for July 4th. If you want to uh, receive that, when uh, we open up on July 4th for that day, then uh, basically check out the description area down there, enter in your email, and uh, we'll send you over access when uh, we open that up on July 4th there for that day, okay? Appreciate everybody joining me as always. Much love and have a great day.